we're on page 72 in the Kuzari. I'd like to start us off with the text. We're in the middle of a discussion between the Chaver, the Torah scholar, and the king. And after the rabbi tells the king, listen, hold your horses, calm down, you have to hear me out, you have to listen to me tell you what it is that I think I need to share. And the rabbi is going to do something very important right now. Very often people say things, and they say them out of context. They share ideas, but they don't build people up to the ideas. Very often someone will say something, how could you say that? But you didn't hear their thought process that went in their head. Or if you know, some people have a discussion with you, and they're talking to you, and they say something that's absolutely not connected to anything that you were talking about. Very often people's minds, they work while subconsciously, or even consciously, while other people are talking, and they reach a certain point, and then they say something that's really somehow connected to what you were talking about, but now they look crazy. The king is about to hear something that if the rabbi would throw out of nowhere, it would, it would really be coming out of left field. It would be something that he wouldn't know what to do with. And therefore the rabbi does something that's building him up, starting from the ground up. When I teach, I try as much as possible, like my rabbi, to always give hakdamot, to always give introductions. And very often my introductions have introductions to them, which have introductions to them. Anyone who's been in a class that I've taught, sometimes I'll give an introduction for 45 minutes and a class for 15 minutes. The reason being that if I give a five-minute introduction, then there are other 45 minutes that nobody else understands what I'm talking about. And it's very important to lay down the groundwork. Someone wants to build a building. So they have to first make a foundation. You cannot build a building on nothing. People who build buildings on nothing, in essence, are not building anything useful. I struggle very much with people who walk into a room, teach a topic, and walk out. It can't be such a topic. It can't be that what you're teaching is a one-time, spontaneous... Uh, it can't. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It has to be something that has a foundation. And actually, there's something very special about foundations. There's a hotel being built in Israel called the Waldorf Astoria. Now you know that Jerusalem is doing pretty good in the tourist industry when they're building a Waldorf Astoria in Jerusalem. All I can tell you is I probably will never be able to spend the night there, right? And for years, they've been building it since I moved to Israel. I'm not even sure that it's up yet. Parts of it are up. It's up. Really? Is it open? No. It's, uh, it's being built. Now, as most places where they construct, they surround the construction site with a, with a metal fence. So you can't see what's going on inside. Once I was walking there in Rehova Gon from the Mamila Mall, I was walking my father back to his hotel on King George Street. And we passed by, and one of the fences had fallen down. And we look inside. It's unbelievable what they did there. They dug down, I don't even know how many stories into the ground. You're looking down, and it kind of reminds you of the Grand Canyon. Unbelievable. Shoot hole in the ground. Oh, and when they were still digging, right? And I looked inside. I said, "Wow, boy, they're gonna have that many floors underground." That's not how they build buildings. If they want a really tall building, you have to dig really deep into the ground. You have to dig really deep into the ground. And in order to build a building, the higher you want it, the deeper you have to dig. Very often, people try to teach very high things without giving introductions, without digging deep into the ground first. You know, somebody that I know was teaching at a school and realized, all excited about teaching Torah, Chumash, Tanakh, whatever it was, started teaching very deep ideas and realized that nobody in the class knows how to read Hebrew. So what do you do? Most teachers, what they do would be just translate everything into English. Big deal, who cares? They're in my class for one year, one semester, big deal. And this teacher decided to start teaching them how to read Hebrew. Oh, but it's supposed to be a Chumash class. Yes, yeah, it's going to be a Chumash class if they learn how to read Hebrew. If they don't know how to read Hebrew, it's never going to be a Chumash class. It'll be a class in English on a topic called Chumash. 
people have to know that it's not embarrassing to go back, Alevet, to go back and dig up things, foundations. And here's what the rabbi is going to do right now. He's going to start building a foundation. But more than building a foundation, there's something called defining your terms. You know, sometimes people will tell you, I believe in God. Do you believe in God? Of course I believe in God. But that guy believes God is a man who walked the earth, who was killed by the Jews. That's his God. So he's saying God, and he means X. You're saying God, and you mean Y. You're, you don't believe in the same thing. In order to say that you agree on something, you have to define your terms. You have to be able to translate the words that you're using. If you remember way back in the beginning of Kuzari, I gave a class on certain Hebrew words. Hebrew words that don't really have accurate translations into English. Such as, an avera is not a sin, it's an avera. A sin is a Christian word. An avera is a Jewish word. Onish is not a punishment. The, the closest English word to onish would be a consequence. You do this, this is what happens. It's not that someone punished you, that's just the natural order of the world. You tip off the order of the world, so the order of the world has been tipped off. We're using a term now. Am segula. And the, the English likes to say a chosen people, the choicest people, whatever word you'd like to use. You'll never come to a translation of the word segula. There's no English word for it. The concept, though, we can try to explain. But how do you explain a concept that only exists in Hebrew to somebody who doesn't even know what a Jew is? Here, the rabbi has to start building not just foundations, but he has to find common ground, common denominators, things that everybody would agree on. You have to know how to find things in common with people. Not to find the things that they'll never understand and start explaining it to them. Find what you first do agree on, terms that everyone understands, and then build on it. Watch the brilliance of the rabbi, watch what he's going to do. We're going to start again from 29. Amar Chaver says the rabbi, Ben Raze Ben Shamen, whether he's fat, whether my words are fat, uh, skinny or fat, they're lean, I mean, they're, they're good words or not such good words. You like them, you don't like them. Please open your mind and your heart to me. Let me first explain to you what it is that I'm trying to tell you. What was the king struggling with? Anyone remember? Yeah, he, was, uh, he started with the story of uh, the story of who we are and God took us through Egypt. So what does the king say? What's, what's bothering him from the story? It doesn't matter. It's a God that took him out of Egypt. Yeah. What, why, what, well, what's so big about them? Why they emphasizing on that? And it's a God. Like, like, who is this God? How do you look at look at number twenty six? Go back a page. The king says, so "What does that have to do with me?" Uh, uh, say better. Say, uh, what does it have to do with me? Meaning, meaning, you're talking about something that you that that, that the Jewish people had relationship with God. It's not, not that it's just the God of the Jewish people, isn't it? Because it everybody else. Beautiful. Says the king of Kuzal, you're talking to me about Hashem through a Jewish perspective. But I'm not Jewish. What do you want from my life? This is not my history. This is not my life. To which we spend time discussing, you cannot believe in Hashem if you do not believe in the Jewish people. Our rabbis tell us that one who denies the divinity of the Jewish people denies the divinity of Hashem. You cannot believe in Hashem without believing in Am Yisrael. You cannot. Because the only proof the only iron-clad connection of Hashem to this world is the Jewish people. The fact that Hashem has spoken to us, the fact that Hashem throughout the ages watches over us, takes care of us, nurtures us, protects us, does miracles for us. We have an intimate connection with Hashem. We have a personal connection with Hashem. And therefore our belief is not some theological discussion of what is Hashem, how is Hashem. Rather, this is what Hashem is. And in order to understand Hashem, who do you have to understand first? The Jews. the Jews. Oh, says the king, I don't like this. I don't like this discussion. This is not what I came to talk to you about. I did not come to talk to you about Jews. I came to talk to you about Hashem. Yeah, says, what's, his, what's his idea about the Jews? Uh, no, also, even worse, he didn't like the Jews. He thought the Jews were some despised people. Says the rabbi, whether my words are lean or they're fat, whether you like them or not, let me talk. 
let me explain to you what it is that I'm trying to share with you. And then you'll learn something. So says the Kuzari, Amar Kuzari in 30, Emor Mashatirze, say whatever it is that you want. So let's see where he starts. Amar Hechaver, says the rabbi, Bidin Hainyan HaTV, regarding natural, organic creations. Nitchayev Lekichat Hamazon Vahagidul Vahaholada. We find that organic behavior, they require nourishment. Animals eat, plants eat, they, they have to be nurtured, they grow, they reproduce. The kochotam v'choltenayim, and every creature, every being has its own strengths, its own uh, necessary qualities and conditions. V'hityached b'ze ha'tzemach u'va'alei chayim, except for, uh, meaning the people who nourish and eat and grow and reproduce, which of the animal kingdom are they? They're the plants and the animal life. Mibaladei ha'adama v'ha'avanim v'ha'motzaim v'ha'yisodot. To the exclusion of all kinds of inanimate objects, like stone, metal, earth, dirt. I want to break up for you in advance the four orders of the world. We have something called Datsacham. Datsacham. Dalid, Tzadi, Chet, Mem. Let me explain this to you. Domem, Tzomeach, Domem is inanimate. Tzomeach are things that sprout, things that grow. What are inanimate objects? Stones. What else? Earth, rocks, metal, metal, gold, silver, natural things, but they don't have any life form to them. Domen, that's Dalit. Tzomeach, the next form. Things that sprout, things that grow, plants, grass, trees, flowers. Above that is Chai. Chai are... Anything that lives, animals, uh, birds, fish. Uh, no, we're not included here. Everything except man that lives. And the next intelligent life form is medaber, those which can speak, which can speak. And perhaps for a later time, why speech is so important that it, it separates humanity from animals. As much as the world will try to knock into your head, humans and animals are not the same thing. Humans are above animals, bakol, mikol, kol, always, forever. Forever and ever. We have an obligation to take care of animals. We have an obligation to not to harm animals. But animals are beneath humans, all humans, when it comes to the way Hashem has built up the world. Domem, Someach, Chaim, Medaber. They tell a story about a, uh, I don't want to, uh, this is an Israeli cab driver. You know these guys, they're, they always they get in a cab, you can smell from the cab what kind of guy it is. He smokes, you know, he doesn't shower for the whole week. Yeah, so these guys have three buttons open in his shirt, and uh, he, he pulls, rolls down his windows in the neighborhood he doesn't know, and he asks the guy on the side of the street, he tells the yeshiva boy, he says, let me ask you a question. Is it, how do I get to X, Y, and Z? And the Shiva boy doesn't answer him. So he says, well, why aren't you answering me? He says, I'm in shock. He's like, what are you in shock from? He says, the first time in my life I've ever seen a domem, you, tzomeach, grow hair, with a chai, a little necklace, midaber, that knows how to talk. <laughs> the first time I've ever seen such a thing. There are four different creations, and there are four different levels of the world. <laughs> And they say about the yeshiva boys in Yerushalayim. They have a special uh, personality to them. They say that the, in the legends, they always had the little Jerusalem boy. Uh, they called them Yele Tov Yerushalayim. Good Yerushalayim kids. They're always very they're smart Alex. To this day, they're still smart Alex. I dream my kids should grow up in Yerushalayim. They'll be smart. Unlike kids that grow up everywhere else in the world. So, this boy was walking down the street and he had a pot. And his mother said, take it from our house. Bring it to your sister-in-law. So he's carrying the pot down the street. And some guy stops and says, Yele boy, what's in the pot? He says, you know, 
If my mom wanted to know what was in the pot, she wouldn't have covered it. And it keeps walking. <laughs> That's the attitude. To know, to be on top of yourself. There are four creations. Domem, inanimate objects. Tzomech, things that sprout. Chai, those which live, animals. And Medaber, those which can communicate intelligently. So, in 32, Amar Kuzari says the king, Zeklal shetzarich lifrototo. This is a rule which we'd have to explain more. It's, it's oversimplified. Avalemetu, but I can agree with you, this is the truth. There are four, spe- there are four what do you call them? Genre, uh, categories. Categories of, of life. And we'd have to speak more about the details, but overall you're right. Okay. How are the two life forms, Chai and Medabel, how do the Kuzari say they're, they're better or different than inanimate and sprouts? In which way? What differentiates them from inanimate objects and things which sprout? They do communicate with each other. They, live they can they, move. They live in communities or families and, and they create. They co-create. So all of these things are in the top three levels. Even the sprouting things. They, they can re- reproduce themselves. They eat, they nourish except for the last category, the most simple one, which doesn't, rocks don't eat or drink, or they just, they are. That's what they are. So let's see Lamed Dalet. Uh, Lamed Gimel, 33. Amar Chavel. Uvinyan Hanafshi, Hityachadu Bale Chaim Kulam. And regarding animal behavior, all animals share the same life force. Which provides them with mobility, natural instincts, midot traits, vechushim senses, nirim v'nistarim, v'tavot v'zulat ele. They're able to process information. They're able to desire things, to like things, not to like things. There is something regarding animals. Animals are a little bit more intelligent than plants. A plant doesn't like or not like. A plant doesn't think about things. A plant doesn't move. It doesn't move, not that it sways, rather move on its own. Animals are one step above plant life, which is one step above domain, domain inanimate things. Amar Kuzari says the king, Gam this is also well known. And there's no way to disprove that a plant is more intelligent of a life force than a rock, and an animal is more than that. Amar Hechaver says the rabbi, in regarding intelligent behavior. The human being is distinguished from all other living creatures. And man's higher intellect, this intelligence that he has, demands from him to become a more refined individual. To establish civilizations, to establish governments, and other forms of social conduct, etiquette, uh, justice, morality, a human being, because it's more intelligent than an animal spe- uh, kingdom, has a higher obligation of how to live in this world. It has an obligation not just to live or to reproduce or to like or dislike, but also to establish governments. It has an obligation to establish social justice, to take care of moral issues, to refine themselves. That's what humanity is responsible for. Amar Kuzari says the king, what does he say? Gam I agree with you also that this is true. And here, my friends, is where we get to some sticky business. Because here, here the Kuzari is going to introduce us to a concept which unlike other Jewish philosophers, the Kuzari is not an apologetic. Not the king, the book of Kuzar. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is not an apologetic. I'm telling you again this a million times. The difference between the Rambam and Rabbi Huda Halevi is as follows. The Rambam stepped out in his Moray Nebuchim to bring the perplexed back into Judaism. Rabbi Huda Halevi 
never stepped out. He was summoned into the king and asked to explain Judaism. To which Rabbi Huda Halevi says, I am not the Rambam. I will not apologize. I will not philosophize. I will not make up things that make you happy. Not that God forbid the Rambam did that. Rather the Rambam's target audience were people who were turned off, who he had to attract because they were Jewish. Jews. Whereas Rabbi Huda Halevi says, you're not Jewish. I have no obligation to teach you Torah. Do you want to discover Judaism? I'll teach you Judaism. But don't expect me to teach you a Judaism that you're going to like. Nowhere does it say that I have to convert you to Judaism. You're a perfect human being, being who you are. But don't expect me to start apologizing for the things that I believe in. Very often, this is the reason the book of Kuzari is not studied anywhere. Because people don't like it. People cannot handle it. There are truths in the book of Kuzar which uh, some people would rather skip over. It's not to say that the book of Kuzari is a unanimous Jewish truth. I cannot tell you that everyone around the world agrees with the book of Kuzari. But it happens to be, as the Vilna Gaon said in our first class, Zo emunat Yisrael v'torato, this is the belief of the Jewish people and the Torah of the Jewish people. Everything is included in this book. Everything. So let's see. Let's see what the king of Kuzar is going to, the rabbi is going to say now. Ve'ezo madrega ata choshev lemala mizot. Turns the rabbi to the king and says, which level, which category is above human? Yeah. Amar kuzari Says the kuzari He has an answer. Ma'alat hachachamim hagdolim. The level of the great wise men. Who is he referring to? The philosophers. The philosophers. Who are the, the leaders of the generation? The people who everyone's looking up to. They think these are the, the most intelligent human beings on earth. They are the philosophers. When the king of Kuzari decides to start discovering religion, who does he turn to? The philosophers. He didn't discount them. He discounted the fact that their belief isn't going to answer what he's struggling with. They don't come to give answers to the connection between God and man, because even if they believe in God, they don't believe that man ever communicates with God. They just believe that man, God's up here, man's down there, nobody, they don't, never shall the twain meet. They don't meet. That's what happens. Amar Chaver, says the rabbi, Eni rotze lomar ela ma'ala tafrid et ba'alea prida atzmit, I don't like your answer. I don't like your answer. There has to be a difference, a, a substantial difference, a tangible difference between a sage, a chacham, and a human. But there isn't. There isn't. Says, I need a difference that is as different as a plant is from a rock and a human being is from a plant. I need something tangible, something different. Then I need the same difference like a human being is different than a behema is, than an animal is. But little minor distinctions, it's useless. There's no use to that. Because that just happens to be a, a consequential difference. It's something, this guy learned and this guy didn't. This one learned how to read and this one went to university. That's the difference of intelligence between them. But not because they're actually different creations. Not because they're different creations. ma'ala al derech emet. So truthfully, according to emet, the truth, this cannot be different. A sage is no different than a human. Aside from the consequences, the, the, the situations in which he has been exposed to. That's the only difference between a chacham and a human being. Yeah, it says here in the, in the note that if you take away wisdom from in, in, an individual, he still remains uh, part of the human race. Very nice. There is a footnote on page 73, footnote 42, where he does mention such a thing. It's true. You should know in Shemona Isla, I'm going to say something now that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in a Sephardic shul and inside of a Chabad building, so please, both of them will hate me for saying this. <laughs> in the Sidhu, there's a blessing, You give a person, You give a person knowledge. 
Uh, Dad is not knowledge, it's, it's a intelligence. It's, it's an ability to think, to process, to come to intelligent conclusions. Umnamen de Enosh Bina. Yeah? And he teaches human, humanity uh, intuition. V'chonenu mitcha, and give us please from you. The Kabbalistic Nosach is Chokhma, Bina, Vedat. Give me Chokhma, wisdom, Bina, uh, uh, perception, and then Dat, knowledge, intelligent knowledge. It's incorrect. Not according to Kabbalah. According to Kabbalah, it's true. That's the order that it should be in. But in all of the Sidurim that come from any old group of Jews, be it the Yemenite Sidur, be it the original Sephardic Sidur, be it the current Ashkenaz Sidur, every one of them says, Give us in this order, Dea, intelligent knowledge, Bina, perception, and Haskel, the ability to grasp things, wisdom. In that order. That's correct. If you want to say the other order of Nkasa, so add it in. Say afterwards, don't, don't fight with the Kabbalists because of me. But a Kabbalah I have from my rabbis and from his rabbis, that you always put Da'at first. Because a human being without dat is a monkey. A human being without dat is almost useless. Obviously still a human. I'm not taking away from people who, for whatever unfortunate circumstances, don't have dat. But we value so much dat. We value so much dat. To the point where Gdolei Israel used to say that if they reach a point where their dat stops working, they want to leave the world. They'd rather not be alive than to be alive and not have dat. Not have that. It's important to have that. To put intelligence first. Wisdom is important, but wisdom is not that. That is something above that. And every chacham and every human being has that. So chokhmah. So now he added wisdom. He's a philosopher. He's whatever he wants to be. That doesn't make him different in a substantial form. That makes him different in that he just knows more. Do you guys agree with this? Yeah. Okay. Amar al-Kuzari says the king, Im ken, if so, En ma'ala b'murgashim yitera al ma'alat b'nei adam. Then if this is true, there is no physical creature that exists in this world that is on a higher level than the human being. Cannot be. We've never met such a form. There is no life form. Like this. today, some kind of aliens, I don't know, they have something for, ah, whatever they would throw at you, right? But, in essence, in essence, you should know. Again, so I, I don't have a stand on aliens, no aliens, life forms. It's not so. I'm still trying to figure out myself that what happens outside of the world is not even in my uh, radar screen. But someone once asked Lubavitcher Rebbe, Alav Shalom, if there could be aliens in Judaism. And Lubavitcher Rebbe brought a few proofs that perhaps the Tanakh does believe that there are life forms outside of our solar system. There are a few. Uh, midrashim, that, that discuss such a thing. Says the Lubavitcher Rebbe, but even if they existed, they're not like what these people are trying to tell you. It'd be no different than a cow or a, or a chicken. It would be something that exists, something that does not have Torah. Non-Jews, they have Torah. They live in a world which was inspired by the Torah. But a, a being that doesn't have Torah doesn't have intelligent life. And therefore it will be no different than an animal that just does whatever it does, because that's what it does. So don't worry about them. That was his, his halakha. What? Ah, yeah, what does it say? It says, Ah, uh, yeah, No, Dea, it says Dea first. The Kabbalists changed it around because the proper order of the Sfirot in Kabbalah is Chokhmah, Bina, and that. But that's a Kabbalistic thing. Halakhically, Dea should come first. And even in the Moroccan Siddur, which we bought, it says in there, it says in there, Chuchma uh, bina dat. And some people say, De'a bina askel, like me. It's not true. In Morocco, everybody said, De'a bina askel. And only when they came to Israel did some people say, Chuchma bina vadat. But uh, I didn't write the Siddur. So, says the Kuzari, it must be, it must be that there is no such life form that is greater or above a human being. Amar Chaver, says the rabbi, V'im yimatze adam, what if you could find a, a superhuman? Shiavo ba'esh, 
who could walk through fire, velo yizakbo, and nothing would happen to him. Viamon mibli machal, and he would be able to stand without eating, velo yirav, and he would never be hungry. Vielefanav zohar, and he would have shining on him a light, a glow. But she would glance at this human being and no longer be able to look at him because he's just glowing, radiating too much. And he will never get sick. And he will never be weak. And when he reaches the end of his life's purpose, he'll pass away when he decides that he wants to pass away. Like a person who will go to bed and say, I'm going to sleep. And he'll choose which time he goes to sleep. And the exact moment which he goes to sleep. And he knows both past and future. What was and what will be. Would you not agree that this level is above humanity, is above being human, that there's a fifth category? They just made up. Superhuman. It's a superhuman. Yeah. If this superhuman existed, yeah. would you now say there's a fifth category? I would. This being is no longer an earthly being. Rather, it's a divine, angelic creature. Asher in Allah... Uh, sorry, if it exists at all. This behavior no longer is part of the four categories of, of beings on this earth. Rather, this is a, a godly being. It's not something that your mind can grasp. It's not one of the intelligent life forms of humans. It's not one of the animals that have a nefesh, like a, a human being. Uh, an, an animal, that's what I meant, an animal. It's not any of the natural beings like a plant or a tree rather it's not even a fifth category because it's not part of this world it's a divine being it's like asking me are angels the fifth form of earthly beings no they may exist but they're not a fifth form of earthly beings because they're not earthly beings they're not earthly beings before we discuss what in the world is the rabbi speaking about we have to discuss something else. We have to discuss something completely different. Because what the rabbi is talking about is part of a deeper discussion which we're going to have, if not at the end of this class, then at the beginning of next class. Because what the rabbi just said was he kind of invented a fifth person and expecting you to believe this person exists. And if you can already imagine where the rabbi is going with this, you'll know that it's not accurate because uh, it's not. Yeah. So let's figure out where he's going. Before we get there, Let's see what it is that we have to see right now. There's a problem here. And the problem is that we, as a universal people, as people who love connection, peace, unity, we're all of a sudden separating the world into categories. There's this category and that category and the next category. And generally whenever people try to separate others into categories, what are they doing? Separating themselves. Hmm? Separating themselves. Okay, yeah, why? Putting, down. Putting them down. Putting them down. In the United States of America, a white person in the original constitution of this country, yeah, not so long ago, a white person in this country was a full human being. And a, a black person was, correct me if I'm wrong, two-fifths? Three-fifths. Three three-fifths of a human being. Three-fifths of a human being. What does that even mean? I don't, I don't know. But there, it had ramifications legally what you could do to black people versus white people. Because that's what they believed. There were different categories of humans. There were humans that were this colored skin, and humans that were that color of skin. And any form of racism 
always does this, which is, they may be human, but it's a different kind of human. It's a subhuman. It's a substandard human. We're the elite human. There, you always hear these terms. The Nazis, Yemach Shema V'Zicham, did not deny that we were not human. They just believed we were a very low level of human, that animals were above. We look like humans, we talk about but we're not really humans. When you dehumanize something, you put it in different categories, all of a sudden it looks like we're trying to separate the whole world into categories. And if I'm above an animal, that means I could do whatever I want to an animal, and that means an animal could do whatever it wants to a plant, and then we suddenly ruin this whole unity that's supposed to exist in the world. There's a Gemara in Masechet Berachot. In the Gemara, there's a rabbi who says, I'm reading it in Hebrew, it's in Aramaic, but, Ani Adam, Vehu Adam. I'm a human being, and he's a human being. What does that mean? It says Rashi, this human being is involved his whole life in Torah. And that human being, his whole life is involved in the field. So, so to speak, the rabbi is separating himself. There's me, I'm a Torah scholar. And there's him, he's a field worker. And it seems to be the separation between Torah scholars and people who work the field. The separation did exist for very many centuries in the Jewish community between people who were scholars and people who were not. Much of the Hasidic movement was built around this notion of unifying the layman, or even below that, illiterate Jews, with people who were the highest tzaddikim in the world, people who were walking in and out of different worlds all the time. But they would dance together. But the Gemara continues, and the Gemara says, Echad, it's a famous halacha. Echad ha-marbe, ve-echad ha one who does a lot, and one who does a little, in Judaism, in Torah, in mitzvot. Haikar shi chaven li The most important thing, the Gemara says, of And as long as shi chaven li bol that everything he does for the sake of heaven. Somehow the Gemara took someone who should be an immense scholar, and someone who's just a field worker, and said, listen, this one does a lot, this one does a little, but at the end of the day, they're both the same. Because they're both facing the same direction. They both believe in the same Hashem. And from this Gemara, we find that there's something called separate, but equal, forgive the historic references that that has. In this country, separate but equal meant also the you know blacks and whites were separate, but they they could not be together. But at least they were equal legally. It's not what it means here. Rather, there are separate, there are different categories, but they're equal, equal in the sense that they're all good. Neither is better, just different. And I want to explain to you what I mean. We say in the Shema, the blessing of the Shema. Kulam Ahovim, Kulam Beruim, Kulam Giborim, Kulam Kedushim, Kulam Musim, that all these celestial beings, these beings in Shamayim, they're all beloved and they're all the holy and they're all great and they all praise Hashem. They're all different. What the difference between a Saraf and a Chayan and Ofanei Kodesh? I have no idea. But they're, they're different, but they're all praising Hashem. They're all involved actively in Hashem's world. You have a hand and a head. And now, a, a hand isn't offended that you would consider it a hand. It ha- you can't, there are many things that a person who has a head, if he, God forbid, didn't have arms, couldn't do anything with. The arm isn't offended that it's not the head. It just knows that it's an arm. And the head doesn't think it's better than the arm because they're just different. They're different. You don't find ever a person's leg beating up the hand. They don't, they don't fight with each other because they're not fighting. There's no competition. There's no better or worse. Rather, what are they? They're part of the same body. They're doing the same purpose, which is uh, taking care of this neshama, or whatever purpose you want to say a body has. But, they're different. Which part's better? You need all of them. Are there different parts of the body? Some parts that are more vital than others? Yeah. You could, a person sometimes got to have a body part amputated. There are certain body parts that could never be amputated. They are different. They're different. They're not better or worse, just different. They perform different functions, some of which are more vital and some which are less vital. There are two views in the world. 
there's what I would call the separationist view. There are Torah scholars, and there are ignoramuses. There are Jews, and there are non-Jews. There are animals, and there are humans. Everyone has got their own thing. There's separation. Everything is a separation. Even between Jews. What are you? Orthodox, conservative, reform, Chabad, Hasidic, smart. What are you? They love to separate. They love to chop you up, put you in a box. People love, there are people like this. Every time I walk there, like, oh, what are you? Are you, uh, what, am, what am I? What am I? What are you? Uh, a duck? What am I? I'm a human being. I'm a Jew. I'm proud of it. Yeah, no, my wife, someone asked her, what are you? Are you Sephardic? I'm just Jewish. It's the truth. People laugh when you say that, but it's the truth. What are you? You're Jewish. What kind? Okay, who cares? I was once in a cab with my rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Peretz. We were going to a wedding. And the cab driver was trying to bring up some discussion. I was trying to find common roots. And he told the rabbi, from which country are you from? Like, which uh, ethnicity are you from? It's obvious to anybody who knows anything that my rabbi is from Morocco. Uh, obvious is, he speaks with the most Moroccan accent you can hear. And he looks at him and he says, in Aramaic, which probably the cab driver didn't understand, <laughs> Lemay nafkamina. And the guy said, Ma? He said, maybe it's a country. Lemay nafkamina, right? <laughs> And so he said, he said, Lemazem Shane, what difference does it make? What he said, I'm sitting in a cab, and you're sitting in a cab, and we're both in Eretz Yisrael. Why do you care? He did not answer his question. He asked him a different question, and there's no good answer to that question. If the answer to the question is because I want it overrelated, so obviously he'll tell you. But if it's because you're trying to take me, put me in a box, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. So there are these separationists. There's the exact opposite. In every da, in every ideology, there's one extreme, and there's always the opposite extreme. You do nothing, you know this is true. Always one extreme and another. Says the Rambam, run away from extremes. Either extreme. Be extreme about not being extreme. The Rambam says that the tr- proper path is the middle path. But let's first find what the other extreme is. If there's one extreme which separates everything, what's the other extreme? Everything is the There's same, no everyone is equal, everybody's the same. Tamine Khamim and uh, ignoramuses, treat them the same way. I, mean, I was once at somebody's house in Israel, and they were speaking bad about one of the Torah scholars in the generation. How can you say that? He said, Tamine Chacham. Happens to be that I don't agree with that Tamine Chacham either, but how can he say it? Said, Who cares? What, he's not a human being like I am? The answer is, he's not a human being like you are. He's a human like you're a human, but he's a Tamine Chacham. There's different kind of human beings. You know, Tamid Chacham comes to a post office. I remember Israel. Tamid Chacham comes to the post office. And the Halakha says that Tamid Chacham does not wait in line. Not because he's better. Because we value the Tamid Chacham's time more than we value another person's time. Not because he's better. But because we all agree that his purpose, what he's spending his time doing, is more important than what I'm spending my time doing. The vegetable store can wait for half an hour. He can't. He's holding up the whole world. You know, if there's a book, Chazon Ovadia. There's a series of books written by Rabbi Ovadia Yosef. And in his laws of Purim, Chazon Ovadia brings down a story, if I remember which Rebbe I would be, a, maybe the Rebbe of Buchach. It couldn't be. I don't want to say that it's the truth. This Rebbe, one Purim, is sitting at his Purim Suda, at his Purim meal. In the middle of a sentence, he's speaking, he jumps up, runs to the bookcase, Pulls out a, a chumash and starts reading. I said, like, what's going on? And for three hours he didn't stop. He didn't answer anybody. He just ignored them. Just read chumash. Learn, 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 learn. Said, well, what happened? After three hours, he closed the book, puts it back on the shelf. Finished his meal. No. What? Says this Rebbe. You know, Purim, everyone's partying. They're at the meals. They're listening to ridiculous Purim spiels. And Purim spiels? Certain Purim spiels? have a special chalik in Gehenom for them. A Purim spiel that makes fun of a rabbi? And there's no Purim that you can make fun of a rabbi about. A Purim spiel that makes fun of people in the community? Lo It cannot be that you can, on Purim, make fun of people. It cannot be. There is no heter. Even if a person says, I want you to make fun, you cannot make fun of them. We have a Torah. So what about the minhag of Haram So make Purim spiels about an Ahmadinejad. Want to laugh about him? I let you laugh about him. But why about the people in the Bitkneset? Why about the rabbi for the Knesset? Why about the, the leader of the communities, about the people who do chesed? For, why? So says this, this rabbi, everyone's partying, everyone's handing out mishlach manot and this and that. He says, but nobody in the world was learning Torah. 
Do you know what happens according to Jewish tradition? If somebody, if there's a world for a moment that nobody learns to lie? The world is Bereshit bara Elohim with Hashemayim v'Taaretz. Hashem created the world. Ki sheshet yamim asa Hashem with Hashemayim v'Taaretz. Hashem created the world that it should only last for six days. I needed to know this. It doesn't say, Ki besheshet yamim. Hashem created the world in six days. That's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, Ki sheshet yamim. Hashem created the world that it should only last for six days. That's what happens. Uvashivi shabbat v'inafash. And on the Shavi'i, something happens. The world rests. Those people who are Shomrei Shabbat, those people who are keeping the Shabbat, those people who are learning Torah, it's because of them that the world is recreated again on Mosei Shabbat. If there were to be a world <coughs> where nobody kept Shabbat, this world would stop, to, cease to exist, and would go back to Tohu Vavohu, go back to before the six days of creation. Daval Yadua, it's for sure, absolutely true. Because Hashem didn't create the world to last more than six days. We keep it going. Someone who learns Torah, what you're doing right now, every one of you, the electricity in this room is only on because of you. So some guy in SD, g and is power, good for him. But if it wasn't for your koach, for your power of learning Torah, for increasing godliness in this world, this world would cease to exist. And therefore, a Tamit Chacham does have a certain level of his job. Okay. We let him cut the line and go back. That's why you'll find certain uh, respects, certain ideas around the Talmud Chacham. Not because he's necessarily a better of a human being. Rather, his job is something that we can all respect. His job is something that we all agree is more important, more valuable. Not that mine is less valuable. His is more valuable. It's not, job is not really the word, but it's, it's the purpose of life. Like right. So the purpose, though, the reason I'm not saying purpose is because anybody can choose to have this job. So it's not a purpose. It's not this one's purpose to sell vegetables. If this one wanted to become a Tamil he could also be a Tamil If this lady wants it, she can also be a Tamil Everyone can be a Tamil Even, you want to, Tana de Even a non-Jew can become a Tamil Even a non-Jew says the Tana de in the time of the Mishnah, that Afilu Goy and Afilu Evet, even a slave, even he can reach the level in Torah of the Kohen Gadol and Yom Kippurim. That's what the Mishnah says. Oh, I wish to talk about it at a different time. I know that we're already pushing 8.30 something. But I, I just want to tell you what I'm saying. There's this opposite ideology. The world is unified. Everything is the same. We're all the same. You can't be better than anybody else. I can't respect you more than I respect a chicken. It can be. And these people, so they stop eating certain animals. They stop, why? Because the world is all the same to them. These people let people die on the... I was driving to industry. Homeless people. They let them starve as long as they save the whales. Why? Because that's more important. Because their priorities are... Mis- it doesn't mean you try to save the whales. It means take care of humanity and then save the whales. It doesn't mean you can't be a vegetarian. You're allowed to be a vegetarian. Be a vegetarian because you think it's healthy for you. Not because you think that I'm not allowed to kill a chicken. Because it's not true. You're allowed to kill a chicken. There's a way to do it. There's a method to do it. So we're not separationists. We don't believe we're better than anything else. And we don't believe in unification. We don't believe that everything is the same. Rather, we believe in different. Things are different, but they're equal. They're different in the fact that there are different levels. But they're equal in the fact that Hashem created every single one of them for a certain purpose, for a balance. That's the middle road. That's the middle ground. So we separate in order to know the differences. But practically, we have kavod for everything, for everyone. Can I take two more minutes? Would you let me? Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I, can't, I can't stop here. It's not, uh... The Tanakh. Which is holier? The Torah, the Nevi'im, or the Ketubim? The Torah. The Torah. And what's next? The Nevi'im. And what's next? The Ketubim. What's next? The Mishnah, what's next? The Gemara, what's next? The Halakha. If I would only learn Torah and forget about the Nevi'im and the Ketubim, I would be a, an ignoramus. Because you can't just learn one, even though it's the holiest of the holy. You need the Nevi'im. You need the Ketubim. You need the human words of our rabbis in the Gemara to understand any of the previous things. It's not, we'll never put, you're not allowed to take a Gemara and put it on top of a Chumash. You know that? You know, it's halakha. You cannot take a Talmud and put it on top of a Chumash. Because the Chumash is holier. 
You can't do it. The Siddur was holier than other books. Earlier writings are holier than later writings. But at the end of the day, you need to learn all of them. It doesn't mean that they're better, just that they're different. That they're different. In Judaism, so many things in our religion are like this. Korach. Korach struggled with the same thing. He stood up and said, kulam kedoshim. Everybody in the Jewish people are holy. Says the Zohar there. The Zohar, if I remember correctly, the, the, the Zohar in Parashat Korach, the Zohar tells us that everybody was on the level of Atzilut. I don't even know what that means. But they were all on the same holy level of, of, uh, ruach, of, of uh, spirituality. Says Korach, we're all kedoshim. How could you say you're better, Moshe Rabbeinu? How can you, Aaron Akwen, think that you're better than us? Say the commentaries. That was his problem. Rav Kook writes this. You know what? Rav Kook says, that's his problem. You're right at Kulam Kedoshim. We're all holy. That doesn't take away from the fact there are some of us which are leaders of the people. There are some of us which are Moshe Rabbeinu. We can all be holy. Moshe Rabbeinu can also be holier. It doesn't take away from my holiness. It doesn't take away from, it doesn't make me a bad person because I look up to somebody else. It just means that I look up to somebody else. It's not a separationist ideology, and it's not unifying everything. It's not making everything equal. And my last example is from the Gemara. There's a Gemara, if I had to tell you the name of the rabbi, I would be a smart person, I don't remember his name. The Gemara says that a certain rabbi decided to bring a cow as a sacrifice. And he's walking with a cow up to Harabait. Do you remember the name of this rabbi? A big, big author of the Talmud, one of the big rabbis in the Talmud. He's bringing his cow up to Harabite, and the cow doesn't want to move. Why? He knows that it's going to die. And he pulls the cow and says, come! The cow doesn't want to go. And he turns to the cow and he says, you shouldn't be so obnoxious. You were created for this. This is what you were created for. It says the Gemara, the cow shed a tear. The cow cried. And he brought this cow and sacrificed it. And for the next 17 years, this rabbi was a sick man. And all of that salat happened to his house. And the Gemara says, because he caused this cow to suffer. Because he caused the cow to suffer. Because he cried? Because he caused the cow to cry. Well, what kind of crazy story is that? It's a cow. And he's right, that's what it was created for. But it's not the way. Just because that's what it was created for, doesn't mean that's what you tell it. Obviously... So it's a, the story is much deeper than speaking to a cow. Mm. But for example, it's nachon. If you could catch a bug, I have a brother, catch the bug and throws it out the window, instead of killing it. You can do that. If you can do that, I'm terrified of bugs, so somebody else can do it, right? But if you can do that, it's a certain level of, of chemla, of compassion. And there are certain things you have you kill. Scorpions are dangerous things. The Gemara says, sometimes even on Shabbat you're allowed to kill such things. Because there are things that can harm other people. Because human life takes precedence over other things. There's an order to the world. And then Judaism says the, king of, the rabbi to the king of Kuzel, you are trying to make everyone the same. You're trying to tell me that you want to study Judaism from your perspective. And here I'm telling you, you're not ready for that yet. Why don't you start with us? Why don't you start to see where we're looking at Judaism from? Let's try to see Judaism not as everything's the same. Get that out of your head. And neither is everything separate. We're not better. We're just different. We have different experiences and we're going to share that. And next week, Bezalat Hashem, we're going to discuss who is the superhuman. Did he ever exist? Will he ever exist? Do we know who the superhuman is? God willing, next week on Thursday night, we'll be discussing that.